We have here a very special treat, inshallah, after everyone takes a break, make your prayer and come back. But we have a beloved brother, beautiful scholar, uh, a fighting Muslim, fighting in the jihad, peace be the law, and that is Brother Ahmed Didek. He's going to be here in just a little while, inshallah, to talk to the Muslims. When we heard that it was possible for him to be a part of this uh, Dawah effort, uh, the Imam automatically offered that hospitality, the facilities, everything that we could do to be here, make him welcome. Welcome, my brother. Assalamu alaikum. But I'm going to be there. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So once again, we uh, look forward to this. After the Maghrib, inshallah, we would like to uh, come back. Inshallah, uh, Brother Didad, if you will, greet the people before you go. Inshallah, uh, meet the Imam. Salaamu Alaikum. A lot of us don't realize this, but uh, Brother Didad holds a lot of trust with us. Awuz Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمًا غَيْرَكُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَكُنُوا أَمْثَالَكُمْ صدق الله صدق الله المران عظيم Mr. Chairman and brethren I bring to you peace and salutations from the deepest south of Africa If you look at the map of the continent of Africa at the southmost point, you will find a country called South Africa. In that country live some half a million Muslims. And on their behalf, I wish you peace and salutations. I say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My dear brothers and sisters, I read to you a small segment of a verse from Surah Muhammad There is a chapter in the Holy Quran and the title of the chapter is Muhammad. If you look at an index like the Quran I have in my hand by Abdullah Yusuf Ali, if you have that Quran, if you open the index, just like a dictionary and the M, you'll find the word Muhammad and it'll tell you it is chapter number 47. And in that chapter 47, the last verse, chapter th uh, verse 38, I have quoted to you the last segment of the last verse. I repeat, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Wa in tatawallaw yastabdil qawman ghayrakum. Allah is addressing us Muslims that oh you Muslims if you turn back from the duties and responsibilities which Allah has imposed on you for being the khaira ummatin the best of people see Allah describes us he says kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat linnas you are the best of people evolved for mankind what makes you the best of people? Is it because some of us claim Arab blood in us or some claim to be Pakistanis or Pathans, Afghanis and some from West Africa? What makes us great? What gives us this honor and this privilege being the Khaira Ummatin, the best of people? The thing that makes us the Khaira Ummatin is Allah says Ta'muruna bil ma'roofi wa tanhawna anil munkar because you enjoin what is right and you forbid what is wrong and you believe in Allah if these are your qualities then you are the best of people if you are the best of people then this honor also puts upon us certain responsibilities there is no honor 
without responsibility. The Imam of the Masjid carries with him certain responsibilities. The mayor of a town carries with him certain responsibilities. The manager or director of an institution carries with him certain responsibility. So there is no honor without responsibility. If Allah puts upon us this honor of being the best of people, it also carries with it certain responsibility. And that responsibility is that we are to share this honor with others. And in the first instance, the very first people Allah Bari Ta'ala wants us to share this with are the Jews and the Christians. In that very verse, Allah says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhrijat lin nas ta'muruna bil ma'roof wa tanhawna nil munkar wa tu'minuna billah. And he continues, Walau amana ahlul kitabi lakana khairan lahum. But if the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, if they hearken to this message, the message of Al-Quran, it will be better for them. In other words, it will be better for you. Minhumul mu'minuna. Among them there are mu'min, faithful people. Among the Jews and the Christians, Allah says, there are good people. I didn't want to say that. You wouldn't like to hear that. But this is what Allah says. Minhumul mu'minuna. Wa aktaruhumul fasikun. But the majority of them are perverted transgressors. Now we are to share this honor and this privilege with these people, with the rest of mankind, the whole of mankind. But in the first instance, the Jews and the Christians were prepared for this message. Allah Bari Ta'ala sent prophets after prophets to them. We name them. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, Moses. Hazrat Dawood alayhi salam, Prophet David. Hazrat Suleiman alayhi salam, Solomon. Hazrat Isaac alayhi salam, Isaac. Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus. All these were Jewish prophets. All the prophets, most of give our children Muslim these names, Musa, Dawood, Suleiman, Ishaq, all these are Jewish names. Allah chose them in the first instance. But he, 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 he is carrying out an inexorable law of his own, that once he selects you, he chooses you for certain responsibilities, for certain position of honor and if you do not carry it out your responsibilities then he says yes tabdil qawman ghayrakum he will substitute in your place another people thumma la yakun amthalakum then they won't be like you so in the religious history of mankind allah bari ta'ala chose the jews as i named some of the jewish prophets then among the four heavenly books which we claim to believe in. We say we believe in the Torah, we believe in the Zabur, we believe in the Injil, and we believe in the Furqan. Furqan is the Holy Quran. Among these four books, 75% are Jewish books, given to Jewish prophets. Torah was given to Hazrat Musa a Jew. Zabur was given to Hazrat Dawud a Jew. Injil was given to Hazrat Isa a Jew, 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 Jew. 75% of the heavenly books that we affirm we believe in are Jewish books, sent to the Jews. But Allah's law, Allah chooses the people for a certain purpose. See, He chose the Bani Israel. As he says, Ya Bani Israel, askuru na'mati allati anamtu alaykum. Say, O children of Israel, remember the special favors which I did unto you. Wa anni faddaltukum ala alameen. That I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. He chose them. But they didn't carry out their responsibilities. They made the religion a racial religion. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. They don't want you. So, a Jew among the Jews, Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, according to the Christian record, he's telling the Jews, he says, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. You don't fulfill your obligations. You don't produce fruits. Then Allah will take away that honor, that privilege and give it, give it to somebody else. And whenever he does that, Allah bari ta'ala, when he does that, when he substitute one people by another, it is usually the people you look down upon. He makes them to sit on your head. This is his way. 
You see, the Jews were looking down upon the Arabs, their cousins. They say that Father Abraham had two wives, Sarah and Hajra. The children of Sarah are the Bani Israel, the Jews. And they say that the Arabs are the children of Hagar, Bibi Hajra. They say Hagar, they call her children Hagarines. Now they call Islam Hagarism. These are new, new terms that are inventing to hurt our feelings. They call the Arabs Hagarines and, Islam, and the Muslims as uh, Islam as Hagarism. This is in the Christian literature. People that they look down, down upon, that these Arabs are the children of Hajra, who was, they say, a bond woman, a slave woman, a woman from Africa. Actually, she was a princess of Egypt. But the Jews, in their hatred for their cousins, they label, they have been labeling the other prophets and their progeny, and they will not leave out their Arab cousins. So I said, these are the children of the bond woman, a slave woman. And as such, yesterday in New York, a Christian woman came for that question time, and she made certain insinuations, saying that Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam was a bastard. Astaghfirullah. And she went on beyond that. She said, everybody is a bastard. Including herself, of course. But, uh, you see, the hatred makes them to speak like that. See, they say that Sarah was the legitimate wife of Ibrahim alayhi salam, but Hajra, because she was a bond woman, a slave woman, a marriage contract had not taken place. As if, you know, uh, three, four thousand years ago, they went to court, like you go today, or go to a church, and in front of a priest, you know, do you accept this woman as your lawful wedded wife? And you say, I do. And they were supposed to go such, through such processes, which was not the case. But however, God Almighty chose Ismail alayhi salam and his children, from among his children, Abiyah Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi salam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, to supersede the Jewish hierarchy of religion. Yastabdil qawmun ghayrakum. The people that they were looking down upon, Allah Bari Ta'ala makes them to sit on their heads. This is his law. We come nearer in the Middle East, during the time of Harun al-Rashid, Mamun al-Rashid, Baghdad, Samarkhan, Bukhara, they made it a veritable fairy land. The Muslims, it was a veritable fairy land. Scenes that existed then, you can't reproduce them anymore except on films. On films you can do anything, Hollywood can do anything. But in real life, no more. No Baghdad, no Samarkhan, no Bukhara. On the borders of our Muslim empire were the Mongols. Mongols, you know, barbarians. Jahangir Khan, Halaku Khan, barbarians. And the Muslims watching them on the borders as these barbarians, what can they understand about Islam? What can they know? They were not interested in propagating the faith. So Allah Bari Ta'ala, as if commanding them, said, go on, put them into the dust, and they attack the Muslim empire, and down into the dust, ruin. The shocks, the shocks that the Muslim world received at the hands of the Mongols, we have not come out of, out of the shocks yet. Yastabdil qawmun khayrak. So Allah says, I will substitute in your place another people. Thumma la yakunu amthalakum. Then they won't be like you. The Muslims ruled Spain for 800 years. There again, they had a wonderful inning, a jolly good time. 800 years. No Christian nation has ever ruled Muslims for that period of time in the history of mankind. The longest that the Christians ruled Muslims is in Mozambique. Mozambique, you know, Mashal, he just met with an accident and he died. Mashal, Samora Mashal, Mozambique, old Portuguese territory. See, about 500 years ago, the Portuguese with the superior gunpower conquered that territory. The ruler at that time was Musa bin Baik, an Arab who was in charge of that settlement. Musa bin Baik, the Portuguese couldn't say Musa bin Baik, so they said Mozambique, Muslim territory. Even after 500 years of Portuguese rule, 60% of Mozambique is Muslim. 
So the longest they ruled, ever ruled was at that place, Mozambique. We ruled Spain for 800 years. And we didn't do our job. We didn't do the job. The Muslims, they were looking down upon the people in Spain, that these pig eaters, wine bibbers, what can they understand about Islam? They couldn't. He says, no, they can't. Your forefathers could. Your forefathers, the Arab's forefathers I'm talking about. Drunkards, adulterers, gamblers. They married the stepmothers. They buried the daughters alive. They could be transformed by this Allah's kalam. But the Spanish people, no. 800 years, you know, of enjoyment. Allah Bari Ta'ala describes the scene. He says, Kam taraku min jannatim wa uyun. So how many were the gardens and the fountains they left behind? Wazu'im wa makamin kareem. And cornfields and monumental buildings. Wa ni'matin kanu fiha faqihin. And wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. Fama baqat alayhim as-sama wal ardu wa ma kanu munzareen. He says, when the... Power was rent out of their hands, neither the heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them, nor was respite given to them anymore. Finish. Just tabdil qawm and ghayrakum. After 800 years of Muslim rule, there was not one man left in that country to give the azan. These very pig eaters and wine bibbers wiped out the Muslims one thoroughly. Not one guy was left in the country to give the azan. Imagine, after 800 years of rule, not one man left behind to give the azan. Allah's law. He says, he was substituted in your place, another people. And I see a lesson in that for us here. Only this afternoon, while listening to brother Awadis Muhammad, I sensed something. That my brethren, the Afro-Americans, I call them blacks, I call myself black, whatever you like to call them, that they have been here for 300 years. And what the Christians did to them in these 300 years. The enslavement. They, re they destroyed their language, they destroyed their culture, they destroyed their religion, everything gone. They couldn't even remember their, their past, their motherland. Unless a man like uh, Haley, he goes and, huh? Alex Haley, he goes and makes a research and tries to discover your roots. That they happen to be in the Muslim land in West Africa. Your forefathers and sisters were Muslims. But they made you to lose everything. Your language, your names, your names were changed, surnames, owning the slave master's names. Same thing they did to our people there in South Africa. Same thing happened there 300 years ago, identical period of time, when the Dutch conquered Indonesia. The people who were fighting for the freedom, they were captured as prisoners of war and shipped to the Cape of Good Hope and sold to the white men as slaves. When the British conquered Malaysia, those people were fighting for their freedom. They were captured as prisoners of war and they were shipped to the Cape of Good Hope, Good Hope for the white man, and sold to the white men as slaves. And they were hammered for 300 years to pervert them into Christianity. But after 300 years, the Christians managed to change the language of the people. They speak Afrikaans, the language of the ruling race in South Africa. They change the surnames. You meet a Muslim, so what's your name? It's a Muhammad Hendricks. Say Hendricks? Say Abdullah Fissa. No, same to you. You say Cassius Clay. You say, you say Muhammad Ali Cassius Clay. Same, same, same. You see? He says, what's your name? He says, Ismail Fenta. So what is Fenta? This is Abdullah Fissa. What is Fissa? And you have the Smiths there among them and the Fantondas and everything among the Muslims of the Cape. Same situation. That the, they're bearing the slave master's name. They lost the language. They lost the culture. They lost the names. But they read in Islam. After 300 years of hammering, they turned out to be one of the most militant Muslim communities in the world. And I was boasting. Wherever I went, I said, my people, not immediately my people, we are about half the Muslims there are from the Indo-Pakistan subcontinent. The other half from the Far East. I'm talking about my brethren from the Far East. They were hammered. We were relatively safe. But they were hammered for 300 years. And after 300 years, I'm boasting that the most militant Muslim community in the world is the Malay of South Africa, Muslim Malay of South Africa. 
But after coming in 1977 to your great country and being in the mosque in Chicago, I came across the brothers there and then I realized that we were coming second best. So I said the most militant Muslim community in the world is the black Muslims of America. And, and we are not ashamed to say we come out close second. But now this is the destiny Allah has in store for any people. You, we look at this scene two, after 2,000 years of Christianity, what the Christians had done to my people, my brothers and my sisters. And if Allah Bari wants to effect a change, who will he use? Not a superpower like Russia. Suppose she invaded the country and made everybody communist. So what wonderful thing have they done? You know, this is one atomic power against another, one nation against another, wipes out half the nation and conquers the other half and perverts them into their way of thinking. Make them communist, make them atheist or whatsoever. What great thing have they done? Nothing. But if a people who are counted as nothing, as rubbish, treated as rubbish for this past 300 years, if that nation can conquer, Allah has done something. This is Allah's word. Because from all human explanation possibilities, we know it's an impossible thing for the Muslims, the black Muslims of America, to change 200 million Americans into Islam. It's an impossible task to our minds. But Allah Bari Ta'ala can do the job. This is His law. He says, يَسْتَبْدِلْ قَوْمٍ غَيْرَكُمْ so He'll substitute in your place another people. ثُمَّ لَا يَكُنُ وَمْثَالَكُمْ Then they won't be like you. And I see in this verse a future for the Muslims of America. Now what is required is the right weapons. I'm not talking about guns and bombs. You know, with that you can't go very far. And even if you had it, Suppose somebody sends you this laser gun. He said, look man, go along in America, threaten the people that if you don't accept Islam, we'll blot you out of, the, of, of, out of existence. Allah will not allow you to do that. He says, like Rahafiddin, there is no compulsion in religion. It's out, it's counted. But we are still to do the job. Allah says, لِيُزِهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينَ كُلِّهِ he says he's given you a deen that is to master, overcome and supersede them all. Kulli. Wallahu karihal kafirun. He said, never mind how much the unbeliever might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. The deen of Allah, deen of Islam. He repeats the same formula another place in the Quran and he ends by saying, Wallahu karihal mushrikun. He said, never mind how the mushriks might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen, to master them all, overcome them all, supersede them all, bulldoze them all. Walau karial mushrikun, now man of the mushriks, the associators, the pagans might not like it. Those who associate gods with God might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. And he repeats the same formula again, the third time in the Quran. He said, Huwa allazi arsala rasulahu bil huda. He it is who has sent his messenger with guidance, wa deen al haq and with the religion of truth. Do you use hira huwa al deen kulli that it may prevail, overcome and supersede every other deen, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, Communism, Judaism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all, bulldoze them all. Wa kafa billahi shahida. He said, and enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that is going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. But it's an honor and a privilege he's giving us, rubbish that we are. Everybody's football. That's what we are. Everybody's football. Everybody's footballing us. Everybody's doormat. They're making us into doormats. They're making nests in our heads. But Allah bari ta'ala, this is not the destiny he has for us. The destiny is as he says, li yuzahirahu ala din kulli it is for us to wake up and go to town. Allah has given us that intelligence, that knowledge, that truth which can bulldoze all falsehood. Now to do that, my dear brothers, you see in your environment, in the American environment, you will have to give battle to the book. You see the battle actually is between two books, the Quran and the Bible. You see the Christian says, that the Bible is God's word, 
we say that the Quran is God's word. That's the battle. The Christian is not prepared to give a hearing to this book because at the back of the mind they are prejudiced, they are brainwashed from childhood with so many prejudices against Muhammad وسلم, and Islam. So when he comes to us or when we talk to him, he's always coming out with the Bible. He says, my Bible says this, my Bible says that, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. So we are forced into a situation where you will have to deal with the Bible. There is no other way. You have to grapple with it. What is the Bible? And believe me, the bulk of the Muslims of the world, I, I'm sure not so here in America, but the bulk of the Muslims in the world, in the Middle East, in the Far East, you know, in my country, the Muslims know nothing about the Bible. They know nothing about the Bible. They, I, I start um, at times, I've gone to the Middle East and I've delivered talks on subjects like what the Bible says about Muhammad What the Bible says about Muhammad. And the translator, a doctor, a very learned man, a professor of Arabic, he's translating for me and he's telling the people what the Torah says about Muhammad in Arabic. I can understand when he's translating what he's saying, what the Torah says about Muhammad. I say, I didn't say Torah. So he changes. He said, what the Injil says about Muhammad. I said, I didn't say Injil. I said, what the Bible says about Muhammad. He doesn't, he can't find a word. You see, I said the word Bible comes from the Greek word Biblos, which means a book. Bible means a book. So Holy Bible means Holy Book. Translate it so. Don't say Torah, don't say Zabur, don't say Injil. Because I didn't say Torah, Zabur or Injil. He's at a loss, poor chap. But I'm sure you, my brothers and sisters, are better informed than that. Now, you know that the Bible is not the word of God. I will be proving tomorrow in Baton Rouge, you know, to my audience, inshallah. And uh, if we can, by Allah's help, you know, subdue this big shaitan. <laughs> Very shaitan. No, no, we must give credit. Look, we must give credit where credit is due. He is really big shaitan. I was in Sharjah, Sharjah the Sultan, Dr. Sheikh Sultan Qasimi. You know, I went to see him and I showed him this poster. And when he saw the picture, he told me these words. These are his words. This is, this is big shaitan. I said, how do you know? You people in the Middle East, what do you know about this big shaitan? He says, no, I was in America and I was fiddling with my TV and this guy came on. <laughs> and he says, I was spellbound. You know, this guy said, even if you're swearing your mother, you can't switch him, switch him off. If you're swearing your mother, you feel like breaking the screen. You feel like breaking the TV set, but you can't switch him off. Now Allah gave him such powers. You know, that charisma. He mesmerizes people. He hypnotizes people. He can make people to eat out of his hands. Like a puppy, you'll have to go to him and lap it out of his hand if you were a Christian. So guy is a master, orator, fantastic. In my life, I haven't come across somebody more potent than him, you know, more um, spellbinding than him. I haven't. I have watched his TV on video. I've got his books. I'm reading his books. You've got to. See, if you go into battle, you don't go with your eyes closed. You must know what you're bargaining for. You must know your opponents, how strong they are. You just don't go in and say, now anyhow, you know, Allah is with you. We know Allah was with us in 1948 and we got a good beating in the Middle East from the Jews. <laughs> he was still with us in 56 and we got another beating. He was still with us in 67 and we still got another beating. And in 73 again we got another beating. Look, Allah is with us all the time, but you got a beating four times. Reason? Because we go into battle with our eyes closed. So we have to go with our eyes open. And uh, in this I have done some little research. He has written numerous books. Numerous. I purchased 30 of his books. <laughs> mm, all these. These are part of all his publication. Mm. I purchased 30 of his books and I read them all. 
you know, like fard, I made it fard, obligatory. <coughs> you have to, you have to make it obligatory. You know, if you are going to, going to battle, you must know exactly what your opponent is carrying. And wallah, I tell you, he's given me so much armament, so much, that the original understanding, that the format of the debate was an hour each. First speaker speaks for 50 minutes, second one 60, and the first man again for 10. And he opted to speak first. First 50, then me 60, and then he 10 again. There are advantages and disadvantages of such a format. But this is the fairest format one can think of. It's the fairest. Now he's going back on the original contract. I left my country. I'm here now. Tomorrow the debate taking place. And he's talking about speaking for 20 minutes. In other words, he wants to gag me for 20. Imagine a man coming from 10,000 miles to speak for 20 minutes. And a thing concerning 1,200 million Christians who believe that this book is the book of God, he's going to deal with it 20 minutes. Reason, you might, you might be able to guess, is the guy's terrified. You see? Because now, 20 minutes, he can make an oration, you know, tantalize, do some little dancing, and you know, create the impression that he won the day. And we won't have the chance to grapple with what he has spoken. But inshallah, pray that things come out right, that at least we have an hour each. Inshallah. Even if it's 20 minutes, we'll do the job inshallah in 20 minutes. But we'd prefer to have an hour. Now in his books, you know he's written some beautiful books. Very potent books. He is the strongest in his condemnation of alcohol. He is the strongest among the Christian evangelist preachers in his condemnation of pornography. He is the strongest in his condemnation of incest. He is the strongest in his condemnation of homosexuality. These books. You know, he is the closest to the Muslims in his morality, his standard of morality. He falls a little short and his theology is of the target, is of the mark. His theology, understanding of God. But otherwise, the man, you would say, he's the closest to the Muslims in his condemnation of all these evils. In his book on incest, which I might, if I have a chance to use, I will use, to prove that the Bible is not the word of God. Incest. He says, incest in America has become of epidemic proportions. Incest. I wonder if you all know what incest is. You do know. I don't have to explain to you. In the Middle East, I had to. You see, I asked the people, how many of you don't know the word incest? And, you know, about half of them, they used to put up their hands. They never heard the word incest. You know, it's not in our common usage. So, I had to explain what incest is. But I take it that the American people are better informed than people in the Middle East or in India or Pakistan. <laughs> you see, in his book, he gives us ten cases of incest from the Holy Bible. That in this Bible, there are 10 cases, 10 different couplings of incest in this holy book, the Bible. So it, it does shock a person. What is it? Is this a textbook on incest? That if you want to know how, what, to, what, what can you do to commit incest? Like it tells you in the first book, in the first book of the Bible called Genesis, I knew about four cases of incest. In his book, he gives me the fifth one. So he's my teacher. He educated me one more incest than what I knew. Father and daughters getting together night after night. And the father made the daughters pregnant and both of them gave birth to a son each. One was named Moab and the other one was named Ammon. From whom we get the names Ammonites and the Moabites in the Bible. Children of Lut alayhi salam cohabiting with his daughters. Then Genesis chapter 35, verse 22, it speaks about Reuben, one of the sons of Yaqub alayhi salam. He go and cohibits with his mother on the roof. And this is Israel was told that your son with his mother. And he didn't even say oof. He didn't even say ah. He didn't even say oof. <laughs> Imagine. The man is told that your son did this to, his, to your wife. Your son did it to your wife, his mother. And he didn't even say he even said oof nothing then he speaks about Ibrahim they say that he cohibited with his sister Sarah was his sister they say Genesis chapter 38 he speaks about Judah the father of the Jewish race from whom you get the word 
Judaism, we get the word Judea, Huda, Yehuda, Yehudi, Judah. That Judah, he's going to Timna to share his sheep and he sees his daughter-in-law sitting by the wayside and he comes up to her and says, allow me to come in unto thee. This is biblical language, the King James Version. Jimmy Swaggart loves this version, King James. So I'm quoting from the King James Version. He says, allow me to come in unto thee. I'm only quoting the Holy Bible. So she said, what will that give me? He said, what? In other words, so he says, I will give you a kid from the flock, a baby goat. So she said, what guarantee that I will give it? Suppose you enjoy and you go away and I don't see you again. What, will you, what guarantee is this? What guarantee do you want? So it says, your signet means your ring and your bracelet means I had a bangle in his hand and a staff, the danda, you know, rod of Moses, asa. So the old man gave it to her and he cohabited with his daughter-in-law by the roadside and made her pregnant and she bore twins, Fares and Zara. There's a long detail about it, long story. Very spicy reading. I didn't know at one time that all these things were in the Holy Bible. I was looking for the other books, you know, called The Arabian Nights, the unexpurgated edition by Fitzgerald. And I got it and I read it, you know. But I didn't know that for 2 and 6, 25 cents, I could have got the Bible and I could have got something more spicy than in the Arabian Nights. <laughs> I didn't know that. You must know. You see, so 10 cases of incest in the book of God. Book of God, for, for what purpose is God telling you all this? That father and daughters, father-in-law and daughter-in-law, brother and sister, son and mother, for what reason? Why is he telling you all this? Now, the type of stories that you read naturally creates the type of mentality that you have. This is a foregone thing. If you eat junky foods, you become a junkie. If you read filthy, dirty stuff, your mind becomes filthy and dirty. And he says that. Who? Jimmy Swagger. He's written a book on pornography and he's telling us that this acts like a drug. Pornography acts like a drug. He says you get addicted to it, just like a drug. Like alcohol, like drug, marijuana, you also get addicted to pornography. Addiction takes place. Then escalation takes place. Then desensitization. These are all his terms. I didn't know. He's made research. Desensitization takes place. And then number four is that you want to act out the role. What you are seeing, reading, you act it out. That is how pornography works. So, in this holy book, there is a beautiful chapter. The highest form of pornography that you can think of. In my country, my government banned extracts from the Bible. It's a very strange government, very Christian. Of course, you know, it has this unjust policy of apartheid, but religiously, it's one of the most religious communities of the Christians in the world. You know, some of the things that I can buy here, your Playboy magazine and something else like that from Heathrow, or, or from uh, Kennedy Airport, or from Chicago. I land in South Africa and I go to jail for two years. That's how strict my government is. Very Christian-like in its morality, its ethics. Now, somebody had published a pamphlet with nine extracts from the Holy Bible, without adding, without deleting anything. Nine extracts from the Holy Bible. And this was sent, somebody sent it to the publications board, and the publications board declared this undesirable, means banned. And there were two priests on the board when they banned this. But these poor priests, they didn't know that it was from their own holy book. They didn't know it. Can you imagine? Verses from the Bible, nine extracts banned. My country, for one word, a one four-letter word, they had banned a book called Lady Chatterley's Lover. One word, one offensive word. For 20 years, the book was on the banned list. They have rebanned it. Now they've grown up now, more mature. They said, now, I think the people are mature enough to read it. That one word. Here are nine extracts which are undesirable. We say, on the same basis, you should ban the Holy Bible. But of course, you know, they, they live by it. They take an oath by it. So it's very, very difficult. But they have done the job. They have given it to us that this is undesirable. Pornography of the highest order. George Bernard Shaw, a British playwright, he says 
He says, the most dangerous book on earth is to keep it under lock and key. Your children must not have access to it. The Plain Truth magazine, you know, the Armstrong family here, yeah, American, American. They are printing 8 million and 80,000 a month for free distribution. The Armstrong family, Plain Truth. They, in one of the magazines, they say that many a censor will give this Bible an X rating cross. Many a censor. Book of God. Is it the book of God? I dare any Christian as to come, come forward and read it to your audience, to your, to your congregation. Read it. No decent man can read it to his mother, his sister, his daughter, or even to his fiancée if she is a good woman. You can't read it. If God Almighty was not ashamed to reveal such filth and dirt, I am asking why should you be ashamed? Are you holier than God? Can you ever be holier than the Almighty? Can you be? That's what it means. If God spoke those things, wrote those things, dictated those things, which I dare not read it to you, because I know you will never forget, even in a thousand years, you'll remember, it says, Uncle Didat was a filthy, dirty fellow. That old man came here, and what, what words he uttered, not, not realizing that oh, I was only reading from the holy book of the Christians. I, it's not my words. But you will not forgive me. I know you can't forgive me. Because you will make an indelible impression on your mind. It's Uncle Didat's lips. You heard the words. Book of God. Book of God that you are ashamed to utter to your congregation. He says no. So there are cases and cases, you know, from his own writings which we can prove that look, this is not the book of God. He speaks about alcoholism. Book on alcohol. In that he says that there are 11 million American drunkards. 11 million drunkards in America. And 44 million heavy drinkers. And he says, and I agree with him, he said, I see no difference between the two between the drunkards and the heavy drinkers, which means 55 million drunkards according to Jimmy Swaggart. I say, brother Swaggart, you must also add this, your social drinkers. Because Islam says, teaches, that whatever intoxicates in greater quantity is forbidden even in smaller quantity. That's what the Holy Prophet Muhammad said. So there is no excuse for a nip or a tot. So if you add those, you also your social drinkers, 800 million drunkards. You haven't got the answer. Because your preachers, he's complaining himself that the preachers, the evangelists, the Bible thumpers, the hot gospelers, he said they are not, you know, taking sides on this problem. He said at a, a church, uh, at a conference of the preachers, these evangelists, Bible thumpers like himself, he said at the conference, is somebody suggested that let us all, those who are opposed to the community, the congregation, imbibing alcohol, please stand up. And he says, nobody stood up. Nobody stood up. Which means they were all opting for drink. And they reasoned. He said, if our Lord Jesus Christ, if he turned water into wine at the marriage feast at Cana, what is wrong with us drinking? If what is good for our God is good for us. And it's good logic. Don't you agree? If it is good for your God, it's good for you. They said, no, no, no. Our friend Swagat says, he said, look, that was not alcohol, that was pure juice. You know, pure grape juice. But the other brothers of his, the general, the, the bulk of them, what you know what they say? He said, you see, this is the same W-I-N-E wine in Greek, which Lot drank and prohibited with his daughter. Same W-I-N-E wine. So, the Christians now, they have no answer to the problem of alcoholism. Simply because it is not in their book. The only book on the face of the earth which says, don't touch that devilish stuff, is Islam. Islam has a solution to all the problems. Wallah, to all the problems, we have it. We must try and save these people from the, the, the mire in which they are. Last June, or the June before, 300,000 sodomites, Qawm Luth, they gathered in San Francisco on a pilgrimage led by 50 lesbians on motorcycles. That nation is harassing the world, harassing our people. At the present moment, out of the world, 70,000 missionaries, crusaders, 60% are Americans. I worked it out, 42,000 Americans are raising the dust throughout the world. 
while in their own motherland, in their own homeland, they are deep in the mire with the sodomites, with the surplus women in, in New York next door. I am told by your statisticians, they say there are one million more women than men. If every man in New York got married, there will still be a million women who can't get husbands. And of the manpower you have there, one third are gays, sodomites, call Can you imagine the mess you are in? There are 7.8 million more women in America than men. That is if every man got married, which will never happen. You know, men get cold feet for so many different reasons. Then your prison population, 98% are men. Then something happens at the weaker sex, you know. You find more widows than widows. You know, men seem to die more. There's something amazing taking place. At childbirth, as if nature is trying to take revenge on man for his cleverness. He's too damn clever. He says, right. Allah says, I'll fix you up. At childbirth, I'm told that the average ratio of male is to female is 50 to 50. 50% 50 each. Equal. But in child mortality, more males die than females. Do you know that? The stronger sex, the boys, the boys, they die more than girls. Why? I don't know. Nobody can explain. We say we are the stronger sex. Who? The male. More males die in, in child mortality. Anyway, everywhere in the world, more males die than females. Disparity. Wars. More men die than women. Look. The proportion is going out and out of proportion. The only religion now which gives an answer to the problem is Islam. But they laugh at you. They make a mockery of you. So you're Muslims. So <laughs> How many wives have you got? <laughs> How many wives have you got? I say, you fool. This is the solution to your problem. You don't listen to us. Don't listen to Allah. Then you simmer in your soup. And they're simmering in their own soup. So, uh, it, is, it is, I'm suggesting to you my brothers and sisters that you acquaint yourself with the weapon that the opposition is carrying once you know what he has then you won't fall foul to his machinations you see you know what he's trying to sell it to you he comes into your house the jehovah's witness the seven day adventist the christadelphians the mormon whoever they are when they come to your house what have they got their bible under the arm they want you to change the Quran for his Bible. Am I right? What else? That is what he, what is he coming to your house for? To teach you ethics? To teach you morality? To teach you hospitality? Nothing of the kind. Teach you hygiene? I say we are the most hygienic people. We are the most hospitable people. Our brother was explaining just now. Says, among the blacks, he says, by nature you are Muslims. By nature, your behavior, your Muslim life, in your compassion for people, in your well feeling for welfare of your people, you are by nature, you are Muslims. What can he teach you? Nothing. The only thing he can tell you is that, you know, Christ died for your sin. Now, that's the only sales point. Believe in the blood of the Lord Jesus and you are saved. Not your good works. So God says that all your good works are like filthy rags, rubbish. That won't take you to heaven. And he's telling the other Christians also. He says, look, good works, if you depend upon it, he says, no, salvation is not that meant for that. Jesus Christ paid the full price. And you want to go beyond that? You are ungrateful. Nimma karam. Ingratitude. Yeah? If the man has paid the fine, penalty, then he said, look, I also am going to fast, I'm going to pray, I'm going to straight jacket my life. He said, what's wrong with you? He's already paid for it, man. You are a fool. His theology is wrong, but his spirit is right. The spirit is there. So, as far as he's concerned, inshallah, you have nothing to worry about. But for you, my brothers and sisters, you must get this book of mine. Is the Bible God's word? You master that book, and I assure you, there isn't a Christian born who can stand before you, including Jimmy Swaggart. Preaching, yes, he can beat us hands down. You know, his acting, he can beat us all hands down. But when it comes to thinking, logic, reasoning, inshallah, you'll find that he's got nothing. He's got nothing. He's not hasn't got a leg to stand upon. So with these words, my dear brothers and sisters, I'll now leave the meeting open to questions. If you have any questions regarding what I've spoken or anything else on the matter of comparative religion, where I can be of any assistance to you, it'll be my privilege to do so. Yes, brother. Yes, come forward. I think if you... Come, come there, here, this aisle here.
but maybe the cameraman might also be able to shoot you without killing you. This one? This one? The, yeah, this one. The, just at the entrance. Just at the entrance, yes. Uh, every question I should stand yeah, put the microphone over here. Thank you. I know if your tape is going to be made into the debate and whether that will be available for us. Yes, I understand that the Muslim Students Association in uh, Louisiana University, they will be videotaping in NTSC. And I have brought my own camera team from South Africa to videotape it on PAL system. Because our system is PAL, and if I take this along, there's too much juggling to be done. So I brought my own team from South Africa. We'll be taping for South Africa and the rest of the world, and the people will be also taping for America. Yes. Stand there, brother. Stand there, sir. There, there, that side. Good. Assalamu alaikum. Wa salam. Uh, on one of, your, one of the uh, videos, uh, that I was able to see one of your videos. In one of the lectures that you gave, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, the natural successor to Christ, during the question and answer period, one of the uh, Christian members in the uh, audience asked a question uh, concerning the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And your reply was, do you believe in the Dead Sea Scrolls? And I would like for you, if you would, to expound on whether there was some doubt about the authenticity of the Dead Sea Scrolls or not. Uh, you see, my dear brother, the question I'll, ex I'll answer, I'll, I'll, I'll explain. The question is that at one of my meetings in South Africa on the subject of Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ, a questioner posed a question regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I must have asked him, as the brother suggests, that do you believe in the Dead Sea Scrolls? Something like that. But now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, I read it many years ago, quite some valuable information there which goes to show that Jesus Christ, a man like him, existed before Jesus was born. They call him a prophet of righteousness. But however, you see, as soon as you enter into that type of material, you are actually wasting your time and the Christian's time. You see, Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran that whenever the Christians and the Jews make a claim, like for example, they say, وَقَالُوا They say, لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ هُدًا أَوْ نَسَارًا so you Muslims will never, never enter Jannah. There is no heaven for you unless you become a Jew or unless you become a Christian. So Allah says an answer to that. He said, Tilka amani yuhum. This is their wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. No? Bakwas, blah, 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 bleating. Don't get frightened with that. Skul, tell them how to burhanako. Produce your evidence. In kuntum swatikin, if you are speaking the truth, let us have a look at your proof. So they produce a proof, the Bible, in 2,000 different languages. 2,000 different languages, the Bible. He says, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. He's not talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. He doesn't say the Gospel of Barnabas says this. He says, my Bible says this, my Bible says that. Allah says, Kul hatu burhanaku. So they produce the burhan. So deal with this. He accepts this, not Barnabas. He doesn't accept Dead Sea Scrolls. Then why are you wasting time with Dead Sea Scrolls and Barnabas? This is what he holds in, under his arm. Deal with that. It's more profitable. Better returns. Now, what I was, the question I was asking, I think the uh, man was, re, was he not referring to Isaiah 53? It's all useless. Wasteless, wasting time. What are you referring to? What now? Brush them aside. Is, is that you, you believe in the Red Sea Scrolls? No, that's what no, I'm no, no, no. He says, no. He says, what the hell is wasting my time and your time? You believe in this book? So let's talk about this. Right? Fair? Okay. Is that a fair way of dealing with it? Right. Okay, that's the question. Now, is not the, uh, some of the text from the book supposed to be taken from the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls? Why Dead Sea Scrolls? Why? Let it be dead, man. Let it remain in the Dead Sea. Why wasting time? Please. Forget it. If, you see, I'm sure you're tripping yourself like the other, other guys. You know, with the Torah and the Zabur, where there's no Torah and no Zabur, you're getting tripped yourself. Why do you want to deal with Barnabas and with these Dead Sea Scrolls when the Bible that is in his hands, you can deal with that? If you can't deal with this, then there's something wrong with you. Get my book and, you know, become an expert on this. I understand everything you say. Jazakallah. Give somebody else a chance now. Assalamu alaikum. I want your comments on this, about this book. Yeah, this, this book. 
Yes. So what? No, no. The comment is, you see, take this as your book. There is a book called Crucifixion or Crucifixion. Have you seen it? No. No. You see, now you go along and pay ten dollars for a Christian book, enemy book. When I'm giving you one book free of charge, you haven't got it yet. This is the trouble. You buy crucifixion or crucifixion that deals with the matter, that lays the ghost, the Christian ghost. Get the book, crucifixion or crucifixion, absolutely free. But now you'll be able to get it from brother, um, brother, um, brother Hamid Ghazali from Lawrence. But please uh, think, please think of sending some postage money. Because, look, the book, books I sent free from South Africa, but it's killing the man, you know, putting, writing for you, putting envelope, putting the stamp. At least if you can consider that, it'll be very good. But the book is free. That one, I'm sure you must have paid more than five dollars for it. Yes. Earlier in your lecture, you twice referred to Muslims, even in America, of African ancestry as black Muslims, which you explained. Would you clarify? No, that is what... You see, I didn't know what to call my brothers. Wallah, I didn't know. There was a time when I had no connection with my brothers here. I used to call them Negroes. You know, talking about the Negroes, the Negroes. And when I came here, they said, no, they don't like the word. They like the word Bilalian. So I started calling Bilalian, Bilalian. Some said, no. You see, we prefer to be called blacks. You see, we are proud to be black. So I said, well, I'm also black in South Africa. You see, I'm also black. So when I call you black, I'm not insulting you because I'm also black. Can you see? So I mean, what do you want me to call you? Afro-American, Afro-American doesn't sound so good. So give me one word that I can call you. What shall I call you to describe your community? You tell me and from now on I will use that term. Huh? Muslim. Muslim. You see? Right, right. right. It's, it's quite right. You see now, look. You know, I, you see, Allah Bari Ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, Sit down. Sit down. There is a Muslim. In America. Of African ancestry. Who considers himself. Black. Muslim. Yeah. Only, only the Negro. The Negro. Considers himself. Considers himself. Black. The non-Muslim Negro. Considers himself, himself black. But the Muslim. In America of African ancestry, he don't consider some, himself a black Muslim? Well, no, I didn't say black Muslim. I said black. I didn't say black Muslim. You see now, Imam in New York, he told me yesterday, day before yesterday, the Imam tells me that uh, Imam, what's his name? Uh, Shiraj. 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 He tells me, he said, look, I said, what shall I, you know, look, I'm, I'm afraid to use any term. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings unwittingly. So he says, no, you can call us black and there's nothing wrong with it. He said, we are proud. I said, you proud to be black? I'm proud to be black. And I, I myself, I'm proud to be black, myself. You see, if the people who understand Urdu, I can, you know, those who understand Urdu, I can tell you in Shairi form. Uh, I'll try and translate it as well. siyah bhakti. मैं क्यों न खुश हूँ सियाह में तो कमाल भी है खुदा के घर का गिलाफ काला सियाह रूए बिलाल भी है इस the poet says इस why should I be proud of my blackness you know seeing that the that the house the Kaaba the house of God is covered in black and the countenance of Hazrat Bilal was also black so why should I be proud of my blackness I am also proud of my blackness. So I am not using this word as an insult. I thought, in case it hurts anybody's feelings. So he says, no. He says, it doesn't hurt our feelings. Maybe in, uh, what place is this? This is Atlanta. Maybe in Atlanta you might have different standards. I don't know. So I'm in a quandary. However, we'll try and solve this inshallah later on. Yes, Ben? I'm a converted Muslim. Yes, you have a religious Islam. I'm a converted Muslim. I, you know, I, I also go to the university and I have a lot of contact with Christians. And they're always asking me questions. Now, I try to use the Bible to design, you know, as uh, an old Catholic, yes. I know a lot about the Bible. Mashallah. And they always come up with one same argument when I talk about the divinity of Jesus. Right. They always take Jesus, God, and the Holy Ghost, and right. they sort of compare it to an egg. Right. You know, the shell, right. the white. I'm sure you've heard this yes. argument. Yes. Okay. Well, um, 
then they say that Jesus is not necessarily God or the Son of God, but He's the personification of God on earth. He's How the, do you deal with he's that? This, he's the personification, personification of God on earth. Who, the, who says that now? Uh, a lot of Christians. No, no, Catholic. Which, which, you see, Catholic, right? Yes. Now, number one, uh, the, uh, the question was, you know, yeah, the Christians, you see, she speaks to the Christians about the Trinity, and uh, they said, now Jesus is not, some of them say he is not God. But if you read Swagat, he says he is God Almighty himself, Jesus Christ. You see? And the bulk of this Catholic fellows, now you were a Catholic, you know better. You see, the Catholics say, the Father in the Catechism, the Anglicans, the Lutherans, the Presbyterians, the Catholics, this is all the Catechism says, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, but they are not three gods, but one God. It continues, the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, and the Holy Ghost is Almighty, but they are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. It continues, the Father is a person, the Son is a person, and the Holy Ghost is a person, but they are not three persons, but one person. So I, 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 I deal with them, I say, look, wait a minute. What did he say? Person, person, person. But not three person, but one person. I said, what language are you speaking? <laughs> Sounds English, but that's gibberish. That's not English. Person, person, person. I said, what is a person in your language? If you and your two brothers are identical triplets, if one of you commit murder, can we hang the other? He says, He says, no. I said, why not? You all look alike. He said, no. He's a different person. His personality is different, so he's different. I said, right. That's what it, how can they be one then? When you say in the name of the Father, you have a certain mental picture. You are not thinking of the Son, are you? He says, no, unless your mind is diseased. When you say, and the Son, are you thinking of the Holy Ghost? No. And your, unless your mind is diseased. Then where did you get it? Where did you get this? This Trinity? Is, he'll quote you. First epistle of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That is the closest approximation to the Holy Trinity, which is now thrown out of this Bible. Thrown out as a fabrication in the RSV, Revised Standard Version, which is the most up-to-date Bible today in existence, going back to the most ancient manuscripts is thrown out as a forgery, as an adulteration. So that's how good your, your dogma of the Trinity is. Your belief is based on a fabrication. Jesus Christ never preached it, nor is it in the Bible. The word Trinity is not even in the Bible. <laughs> yes, my brother. Then figure out, what is this, uh, the, 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 the strategy of the Jehovah's Witnesses? Because uh, due to the fact that they are, most of their converts within, they are more or less uh, program them to where they, they can't read no other, other religious, religious li literature, you know, and they can't attend uh, interfaith worship, uh, interfaith worshipers. So I'm trying to figure out what kind of strategies they use on, uh, on their followers, of uh, which you know anything about that. And uh, my second question was that uh, uh, Jimmy Swigert, even though you have said some good things about Jimmy Swigert, but he, he have occasion sometime in, in his uh, speeches with him, he has said derogatory things about Muslim. And I see, you, see you, you seem to think you speak real highly of him, so, you know, uh, yes. no, I'm trying to figure out, it seems like it's a contradiction in, in Jimmy Swagger because uh, he, he, have, he have sided with the Jews against the Muslims in, 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 in certain areas like in Palestine and uh, yes. yes. No, I didn't talk about his preaching, that what he believes about Israel is right. What I said was that the guy was a master orator. He was a great mesmerizer. Look, I didn't say that his teachings are right. What he believes is right, I'm telling you, I said, look, his theology is wrong. You see, his condemnation of alcohol is right. His condemnation of incest is right. We agree with him. Can you see? So you can't say no, because he says that, you know, alcohol is bad. So we must say, no, it is good. No, we can't. If he's condemning it, we say, we are with you. We are with you. But that doesn't mean you agree with his theology or his attack on Islam or the Holy Prophet Wasallam. But you must acknowledge that the guy is a great orator. That is what I was trying to say. Not that the guy, what he says is true. With regards to the Jehovah's Witnesses, you see, they are today claiming 
that the second largest group of Jehovah's Witnesses in the world is outside the United States is the Muslim country of Nigeria. And that's a fact. They are the hardest working people, the Jehovah's Witnesses. We must also take off our hat to them. You see, five times a week they gather in the kingdom halls. They are the fittest people to give battle to the other Christians and they are the fittest Christians to give battle to us. Why? Because they practice five times a week. We are supposed to be practicing five times a day. The Quran, computerized, but it's like water and ducks back. Therefore we find ourselves in this position. You see, we are supposed to be reminding ourselves about duties and obligations which Allah puts upon us, His instructions to us, five times a day. That guy is doing five times a week and then he's the fittest fighter. We doing five times a day and there's no sign that you know we have benefited from our salat. In other words, we have imbibed the lessons, we haven't. So the thing is again that we have to acquaint ourselves when we are reading, try and understand what we are reading so that we get programmed with that instructions that we can carry them out. Then we can also become fit, fitter than the Jehovah's Witnesses. He, what he does five times a week, we are doing five times a day. We should ought to be. Yes. Amen. I wanted to question your uh, position on polygamy. It, it uh, seems... Now this, uh, excuse me, this will be the last question. You don't mind. We still have to go to Baton Rouge. We have to take a little bit of a break. You know, we have a big battle ahead of us tomorrow. So, please, excuse me, not we are trying to run away now, you know, because otherwise you are here, this is your hometown, you can go to sleep anytime you like, we still have to catch a plane, we are on the waiting list, what do you call that, standby, and we don't know what happens, we are in suspense, please, give us a little break, this will be the last question. Alhamdulillah. Yes. In this country, the, the law as well, the, the, the communal law as well as various religious law, places... Um, very great interest on not having more than one wife. Right. Polygamy is illegal. Right. And our nation has taken on the understanding of Quran to be that Allah says if you have more than one that you should treat them equally, right. which was the challenge because if you had more than one, you, you could not treat them equally. And if so, then how? Yes. You see, with regards to the law, you know, the law that he has made, we have to reason with him, talk to him. I says, you know, you, you Americans and you British, you have legalized sodomy. Men to men, legalized. Lesbians, legalized. Polygamy, which is the most natural, you put the man in jail. If a man begets a dozen illegitimate children every year, he's a stud. He's a great guy. But he can beget a dozen bastard children and if the state pays for it, he's okay. So I said, there's something wrong with your thinking. And every American I'm talking to, he agrees with me. I said, there's something wrong with your thinking. You've got to brainwash them. You fools, you allow 300,000 sodomites to gather in San Francisco. Legal. Led by lesbians, legal. Huh? One third of your New York gays, legal. And if a woman, and one million women can't get husbands, and if she's prepared to share a husband with another woman, you want to put them in jail. There's something wrong with your mentality. And he agrees. I saw a program when I was in Canada, beamed from somewhere near Buffalo or Chicago, which I saw. And I saw on that program on polygamy, you know, on your TV, from, beamed from America. There was a, a Mormon, ex-Mormon, he was excommunicated because he had more than one wife. But he had eight wives and they were all with him on the stage. And he said, they're all happy. See, don't register, but he's got eight wives, all happy, he says. And he said, all of them, not one of them was married before. Not one of them was married before. Then there was a middle-aged woman in the audience, a little plump, plumpy. She says, what about me? He says, you too, madam, send me your address, <laughs> I'll contact you. <laughs> Look, you see, they are programmed that way, brainwashed. You got to reprogram them. With regards to your suggestion that you must do, uh, must be absolutely just, Justice that is demanded by Allah is this, that you deal fairly with them. If you buy a, a Volkswagen Beetle for this one, you buy one for that one. If you have a, a flat costing $500 a month, the other one also should be given something equivalent to that. In the material aspects of life, you are just. In your affections, no man can be. And Allah is not demanding from you something which you can't do. You, if you have two twin children, twin. They are both yours, they look identical. But between the two, one of them you love more than the other. Why? 
Will Allah question you about that? No, no. But if you bought an ice cream, one dime's worth here, and you bought one box worth here, Allah will question you. You see? That he'll question you. So why did you buy for a dime here and a buck there, you know, a dollar there? That he will question you. But, you see, you see, something happens, you know, you feel more towards one and then the other. But in the material aspect, if you spend one week with this one, you speak one week with the other. If you spend one day with this one, you spend one day with the other. In that, Allah will question. But he won't question you what was going through your heart. See? Because over that, you have no control. No man has control. Our Nabi Kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if you remember, if you read his life, his biography, you find that towards his last days, you know, he, was, he had to be carried on a stretcher, you know, from one, one Ummul Muminin's house to another. And as he is being carried, when he says, you know, when is Aisha's turn? You know, when will I be in Aisha's house? Next day, carry to another house. Say, when will I be in Aisha's house? So the other Ummul Muminin, the mothers of the faithful, they realize that, look, he's got yearning for her. We forego our rights. Even while dying, he was fulfilling his obligations. That you do. That Allah will question you. Say, now, did you? He says, yes, I tried my best, my Lord. Good enough. Affection he has for Aisha. Allah won't question you. Why did you have that feeling for Aisha and you didn't have for the other women that much? No, that is not too questionable. And this is the solution to the problems. And you also solve your problems. I'm telling the Arabs before coming, I came through the Arab countries and I was telling them, I said, look, there are 7.8 million women who can't get husbands in America. One million in New York alone. I said, you fools, you're running to Beirut and running to Bombay and running to London and to Paris. I said, go to New York and solve the problem and solve your problem. You know, <laughs> your countries are vast, empty. <laughs> Jazakallah, thank you very much for this opportunity. Pray for me for our success, inshallah, tomorrow.